The following program was paid for by the friends and partners of Kyle Winkler Ministries. Welcome, I'm Kyle Winkler, and today I have the pleasure of bringing you a life altering conversation. After more than 30 years of ministry and 20 books, God gave international speaker and best-selling author John Bevere a message like none other. It's the answer to breaking free from the obstacles and challenges that hold you back, the secret to the supernatural life experienced among the first Christians. When I heard the message, I said, everybody has to hear this. So I caught up with John for the kickoff of his tour with Bethel, where he sat with me to share it with you. Are you ready to finally live the victorious life God desires for you? My revealing conversation with John Bevere starts now. John, you've been in ministry now for more than 30 years. Yeah, that's right. And I have. I know that you extensively. I started when I was one. But anyway, you go started ahead. with you. <laughs> that's good. That's a total lie. <laughs> well, you were called to it, right? So God had a calling right. on your life. But, but you extensively travel and you speak. And now that you are more than 20 books in, God has given you a message that you've said is your hardest message for you to write. In fact, you wanted to quit it like five or six times. Actually, I think it was six times. Six yeah. times. Yeah. But God said, no, well, I, I, I'd get up in the morning. It's like I, if I, the, the sixth time I finally I, I woke up and I said, I don't even like this message. I don't want to write it. And that's when the Holy Spirit really, really got firm with me. And he said, son, if you don't write it, I'll give it to someone else. He said, because this book will contain vital truths that my body needs to really bring in a move of my spirit. The la the, I believe the last great move of his spirit that the Gentiles are going to see, the latter reign. That's a powerful statement. It I mean, is a strong th statement. That's saying a lot. So what is this message that God has given you? And, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to let, let, let's stop right there. Now, I believe it's, he's giving it to his church. Okay. I believe I'm one of many voices. So in other words, let, let, let's say like this, I believe he was saying, I'm going to get this message out. And if you don't do it, you won't be a part of it. So wow. it's, it's all of his voices. I mean, God, I, I really believe in the old Testament, there was one man, there was one woman, I, you know, John the Baptist, one man. But I believe that the people that really walk with God in the New Testament, we either know what he's saying, and when somebody articulates it, it identifies with what's already in our heart, or what happens is many people are just saying it and everybody's coming alive to that word. So I believe that this will be spoken by many, many people. So John, I think a lot of people are on the edge of their seat now wondering, what is this message that God has given you that is so important for the body of Christ that God told you would change individuals and families and entire communities? What yeah. is that message? Well, the title of the book is called Killing Kryptonite. And uh, there's, there's similarities between, you know, if, in, unless you've been on a deserted island for the last eight years, everybody knows Superman kryptonite. I mean, right. he's almost an American folklore, right? So um, kryptonite, Superman, I see a lot of similarities between a Christian and Superman. Uh, he had otherworldly powers. We have otherworldly powers. He's not of this world. We're not of this world. He um, liberates the oppressed. We liberate the oppressed. He draws the strength from the sun, S-O-S-U-N. We draw strength from the sun, S-O-N. Okay. So, but there was this one substance called kryptonite. And if he came in contact with it, it neutralized, literally neutralized his otherworldly powers and made him even weaker than a common man. And the interesting thing that I saw, especially in the movie that was done, I think it was was two Supermans ago, he didn't realize he came on the kryptonite until it had already affected him. Wow. So he wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, there's kryptonite, stay away. Yeah, he knew to stay away. He, you know, just because of, he was, he was, he was, um, what's the word I'm looking, seduced to come into it. So there's a kryptonite, a spiritual kryptonite. Superman and kryptonite are fictional, but spiritual kryptonite I've learned is very, very real. So I was actually doing an in-depth study on the book of Corinthians and, and, and the the book of Kings, uh, Kings and uh, Kings and Chronicles at the same time, and I started seeing things in 38 years of reading the Bible I'd never seen before, and I realized that if you look at the early church, mm -hmm. and when I say the early church, I'm talking uh, the book of Acts 1 through 12. That's 30 to 34 A.D. All right. Some they're pretty invincible. supernatural stuff is happening. Oh my gosh, they're invincible. I yeah. mean, they're having to convince people they're not superheroes or gods. They're taking entire cities, Kyle. And, and yet, 
you come to the Corinthian church, we say, wait a minute, the Corinthian church is the early church. No, they're not. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians was 56 AD. Right. That's 26 right. years, 25 years. A lot can happen in that time, right. as we know. So they are, they have issues, and everybody's got issues. I'm not getting on the issues, but you know, they're you got favorite preachers, they're suing one another, they're quarreling, they're disputing. They're not much different from divided. what's happening today. No, and sexual immorality, they're actually suing one another. And Paul finally said, for this reason, many of you are weak. And what did kryptonite do to Superman? It weakened him. This was weakening the church, the Corinthian church. Whereas the early church, they were invincible. There was nothing weakening them. So, so you're saying here, and I want to get into what is kryptonite here in just a yep. few minutes. But what I'm hearing you say is that we are all originally called to be supermen and women as Christians, right? That we are kind of a type of Superman. Yeah, when Jesus said, you're the light of the world, let your light shine that men may see your good works. He didn't say, hear your good scriptures. He said, see your good works. Yeah. So I believe if you're, if you're in the marketplace, you're in education, you're in, uh, let's say healthcare, let's say you're in government, you should be standing out above everyone because of the light that's in you. God lives in you. I mean, Amy Simone McPherson, the Hollywood producers like Charlie Chaplin would sneak out to her uh, illustrated sermons to get ideas from her. We today, find, I find ourselves constantly, the world's, we're copying the world instead of with Amy, the world was copying her. And that's, I believe, the way it should be. Because the only, the creative human being, or excuse me, the creative being of the universe is God himself. So, you know, and we're living far below what we're supposed to be living. Because we've got God's nature inside of us. Yes. And so yes. we should see that creativity and that power that comes out of God. We should see it yes. in our lives as well, which would make us the Superman or Superwoman. But you're not going to find it with people that aren't connected to Him. The people who know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. What's the key? Knowing Him intimately. So you're not going to know God intimately. Here's the way I see it. I could be married to Lisa, right? Technically have a relationship with her, but if I'm jumping in bed with other girls, she's not going to be intimate with me. So I'm not going to get the secrets of her heart. I'm not going to get the desires of her heart. She's not going to sit there and look at me on the pillow at night and tell me her deepest, most inner secrets. That's not happening. I may technically be married, but I've just lost intimacy. Many, many believers don't have intimacy with God because we, the communicators, the preachers of the gospel, have shied away from certain truths of the New Testament. And when you do that, people fall short. Then they get frustrated. Is God really real? I don't see much evidence of Him in my life. John, now a lot of people are listening to you and they might admit, I don't live that life, John. I don't have the, the supernatural lifestyle. I don't have the life of those in Acts. Why? All right, so we're talking about this kryptonite that neutralizes us. So that's why I believe many people, many of us, I'm going to say us, we're living below where we should be. Our life should be, I think, even much more fruitful. I think if you look at what God promises, that the latter, the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the former. You know, I'm, I'm praying one day and the Lord spoke to me and he said, what you will see in your lifetime will appear as child's, it will make the book of Acts look like child's play. And you have to understand, I mean, that's pretty remarkable. Peter's walking down the streets <laughs> yeah. and people are getting healed. That's like walking through a hospital and everybody, and just emptying I mean, it. Think of that, Read, reading the, the book of Acts and all the miracles happening and to be able to say that it's going to be greater right. in your lifetime. Right, right. So what is what is the kryptonite? I mean, this is something that it took me 13 chapters in the book. You've read the book, right. you know, to introduce it. It comes down to one word, and I want, I want, I want everybody to listen to what I'm about yeah, I to say. I want to hear this here. Kryptonite comes down to one word, and that word is idolatry. But I, now, idolatry. Idolatry. Now, I think some people think of idolatry as something in the past that they bowed down to statues and stuff. Right, right. But you're not talking about that. So here's where everyone's mindset in America that's a Christian goes if they hear the word idolatry. Tat statues, temples, altars, as you just said, right. or putting my favorite football team above Jesus. Okay. Okay. So yeah. that's it. That's our, right. that's our limited understanding of idolatry right there. That was mine. Okay. And I've been traveling all over the United States and I have to say, that's probably most of ours. All right. Mm -hmm. I put my girlfriend above Jesus. I put my job above Jesus. I put the ministry above Jesus. Okay. 
But this is why I'm writing this book. To really understand, because this is what the Holy Spirit kept doing, is find out the root of idolatry, find out the root of idolatry. And I kept having to search and search, and finally He just opened it up to me. To really understand idolatry, you have to understand two words. The first word is covetousness. Covetousness. Yeah, Paul said covetousness twice in the New Testament is idolatry, or idolatry is covetousness, okay? He says it in Colossians 3, 5 and Ephesians chapter 5. So what does the word covetousness mean? It means it's a strong desire for something supposedly good for you, okay? Um, one of the Greek lexicons labels it as this, it's amazing Kyle, a self-idolizing, grasping spirit is what that word means, okay? so. Let's just leave it with a strong desire of something that you believe is good for you. The other word you have to understand to understand idolatry is the word stubbornness. Now if you'll remember when Saul disobeys God, the prophet Samuel comes to him. Saul said, I did obey God. Samuel said, what's the beating of the sheep? And he backs him in the corner. Samuel says to him, he says, for, it, for rebellion is witchcraft right. and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Now let's isolate that. Okay. Stubbornness okay. is as idolatry. Is as are an italic type, which means they're not in the original Greek. Right, okay. So he's I'm saying tracking. stubbornness is idolatry. All right, what is stubbornness? Stubbornness means to push back. The Hebrew word literally means push back. So let's put it all together. When I push back from something God has clearly revealed to me, in order to get what I believe is good for me. I have now put my will, my desires, my wishes above His. That is the root of idolatry. So you're telling us that this kryptonite that's weakening us is idolatry. just that. It's idolatry. It's us putting our desires yes. okay, so above let, what let, God let's just Let's just make it clear. The Bible speaks very strongly in the New Testament about fornication. Right. Absolutely. Sex before marriage. It says, don't let fornication even be named among you. Uh, it says, the marriage bed is undefiled, but God will judge the sexually immoral, right? right. Fornicators and adulterers. Right. Okay, so when I push back from that, because all of society is doing it, come on, says it's okay. 95% right. of the people live together before they get married. I push back in order to get what I believe is good for me because, hey, we can save money. We don't have two different rents. We don't have two different utilities. All these supposed benefits. We can build for our future. These are all the supposed benefits, right? So you, you, you embrace that to push back from what God has clearly stated. You have put your will above God. See, this all started right in the garden. Yeah. God clearly revealed, hey, I want a relationship. Here's probably 2,500 trees, because there's 2,500 known different fruit-bearing trees in the world. And God says, if I don't want you forced into a relationship with me, if you eat from that one tree, you're just saying, I don't want a relationship with you. You die. So Eve and Adam pushed back from what God clearly revealed to them in order to get some supposed good. When the woman saw the tree was good, she didn't see the tree was evil. She wasn't tempted by evil. She was tempted by good. She was drawn to the good side. The pleasure and the wisdom and the things that it could possess, the benefits that we're talking right, about. Right, So that's idolatry. Really, we're talking here about sin is, is what we're getting into. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of people, we don't like to talk about that word anymore. I mean, can you imagine, in the church, I mean, you know, you, you travel all over. Nobody wants to mention the word sin anymore. And there's a lot of definitions. How do you define it, John? Disobedience to God's authority. If you look at sin, the Bible says, you know, the Bible says adultery is sin, fornication is sin, um, drunkenness is sin, but the Bible says sin is lawlessness. Mm -hmm. So now what the Bible is doing is giving us the definition of sin. Lawlessness is the he Greek word anomia, which means you're not submitted to the authority of God. So simply put, Adam didn't jump in bed with a prostitute in the garden. He simply disobeyed what God spoke to him. If you look at the parable, remember the guy in Luke 14 said to Jesus, oh, the people are going to be so blessed to get to eat bread in your kingdom at the marriage supper. And he said, hey, there's a guy that threw a great feast, right? He invited people. First guy said, oh, I bought a piece of land. Please have me excused. He put his desires above the will, right? 
Another guy says, I've married, I really can't come. He put his desires above the invitation, right? Do you know what Jesus said? None of those men that were invited. Now, marrying a woman's not a sin. <laughs> right. Otherwise, there'd be a lot of sinners. Buying land's not a sin. Right. Another guy bought business equipment. That's not yeah. a sin. But when the business equipment and the business is more important than instantly obeying the Word of God. That's when it's an idol. Falls under sin or idolatry. Then it's, then it's a sin. It's a sin. John, you say that we don't have to be puppets to sin, that we can actually master sin instead of it mastering us. And something that I've loved... And God said that right to Cain. Yeah. Right in the beginning. Yeah, that's right. It sins at your door. There's a door into our soul, right? And its desire is for you. So sin has desire. Right. But you should rule, rule it. Rule over that. Yeah. And one thing that you have said for years that really spoke to me a lot even and it, it's a different definition of grace than I think a lot of people have. You know, a lot of people think of it as sometimes, unfortunately, as permission to do whatever you want and then get forgiveness from God. But you actually have called grace empowerment. And so you're saying that grace is the way that we can master sin. Explain that to us. So, unfortunately, we've undersold grace. Mm -hmm. We say grace saves us. Totally true. Grace is a free gift. Totally true. Grace forgives my sins totally 100% true, but we stop right there. What we don't tell people is, what is grace? It is God's empowerment that gives us the ability to do what we weren't able to do in our own ability. If you look at what the Apostle Paul, he's struggling, God comes along, and what is, these words are read in the Bible. He says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power. Now God says his grace is his power. For my power works best in your weakness, your human inability. Peter says, grace be multiplied to you as his divine power has given us everything we need to live a godly life. Peter defines grace as his divine power, yet we've reduced it to just fire insurance or permission. Right. And if you look at the permission aspect, Jude says, clearly in the NLT, that there are going to be teachers that will come along saying that grace gives us the ability to live an immoral life. Mm. It covers us. And we have that today. That's not grace. Okay, grace empowers us. Yes, grace has forgiven us, but grace is the empowerment that gives me the ability to do what truth demands of me. In the Old Testament, in order to be an adulterer, you had to physically jump in bed with a woman because you're under restraints. The New Testament, we've been liberated on the inside. Our whole nature, right in those same words, Peter says he's given us his divine nature. So we have a mind. So that's why the renewing of our mind is what will transform us. Right. Because what happens is your mind, your will, start aligning with the purposes of God, the will of God, the counsel of God, and you start making decisions that are good for you. Yeah. If I plant a bunch of weeds in that, in that soil right there, I'm going to get a weed farm. Surprise, surprise, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. But if I put apples and all that. So God empowered us to be able to plant good seeds. The fruits of righteousness, as James talks about. I tried to get free from pornography for six years in my own strength, and I couldn't do it. What was that change, John? Because I know you even mentioned in your book that you even went to a deliverance minister. Yeah. And it didn't work. Did. But what, what did work for you on that? It was the difference between godly and worldly sorrow. Godly, so godly and worldly sorrow, sorrow okay. produces repentance leading to deliverance. Worldly sorrow produces um, death. What's the difference between godly and worldly sorrow? Worldly sorrow is, focuses on you. Oh my gosh, am I going to go to hell? Am I going to get judged? Am I going to get punished? Am I going to lose my marriage? Am I going to get fired for doing this? That's worldly sorrow. Caring about yourself, really. Yeah. Judas had that. Okay. Threw right. the money back. He had remorse. Yeah, he he said, I'm sorry. I've sinned. He, he said all that, but he killed himself. He didn't go back to Jesus and said, I have hurt your heart. Because he had no relationship with Jesus. Right. I'm talking about intimate relationship, right. okay? So that's, um, that's, that's worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow is when our focus is on him. David sinned, he said, God against you and, and against you only have I sinned. Saul was concerned, his reputation was hurt. So my problem was when I went to that minister who had a powerful deliverance ministry, I was scared that that sin was gonna keep me from the ministry that I knew I was called to. The focus was me. Nine months later, after I'd been praying, God, I want to know you intimately, now that was, my heart was breaking because I was hurting him. That was the godly sorrow that produced the repentance that led to my freedom. So that's what, you know. So it, it took God. you really caring about the heart of God more than caring about you, mm -hmm. which is yes. really 
pushing down idolatry. Right. When you think about it right. in your life, that kryptonite that we're talking about here. And I know that you've said that was that was the day that you were set free. Yep. But God desires for us to be made right. free. What do you mean by There's that? There's a difference between set free and made free. Set free, I couldn't, it, it was amazing. It was like, it, it, it was like, uh, pornography was metal shavings and I was a magnet. If it was anything anywhere in the area, it would just come to kind me. Kind of attract itself oh, to it you. It was amazing. When I got free, I had the power, and I had no power to look away from it. I had the power now to look away from it. So if I went by a girl, like let's say I was walking down the road and, or a sidewalk and, and a girl that was dressed in very uh, immodest clothing, I just looked down the corner and just let her go by, right? And, and I realized mm. this, isn't, this isn't freedom. Right. And so I kept praying, even though I was free, I could totally now walk away from pornography, not look at pornography, not be tempted by pornography. I had the power to say no. Okay. But I didn't have the heart of God on it. So I, I, it took a couple years and I, and I started saying, God, let, let me understand how you, you see this. Right. And God started showing me how he sees women. And the first revelation that came is every woman is somebody's daughter. Then the next revelation that came is that woman's God's daughter. Ooh. She was created in the image yeah. and likeness of God and crowned with His glory. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden now I'm like, whoa. So now, and this is, the, this is the honest truth, if pornography is flashed before me, I'm repulsed by it. The guy that actually couldn't resist it, and it was like a magnet, now is repulsed. So I believe what happened is, I'll show it to you like this. I can have a glass of water, and I can set it free from the water by turning it over. Mm -hmm. But now it's empty. Mm -hmm. It can get filled again. What am I going to fill it with? So what God showed me is I had to fill it with his heart, uh -huh. with his word, with his counsel, instead of being seven times worse. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Okay. So just picture when, when, it, when, when, when a guy gets free from something, it's like emptying that glass. Now the revelation of God Revelation knowledge, the heart revelation knowledge has to fill that glass. And you get that by spending time with him, spending time. By word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. That's what does it. So for his the, desires literally begin to grow in you. So for the person that is watching this and they're starting to identify the kryptonite, the idolatry, the areas where their flesh is above God's will mm -hmm. in their life. Mm -hmm. What's the one step that they should take right now? Is there a step? What, what should they do? Yes, repent. Repent. <laughs> Nobody likes to talk about that word anymore, John. It's the most wonderful <laughs> word. And, and People and, tiptoe around it now. Yeah, what, so what, what do you mean by repent? It is one of the most empowering words in the New Testament other than Jesus. Repent means a change of mind. It's a change of heart, change of will. It's when we do an about face. It is a gift from God. So when God grants us the gift of repentance, we actually have the ability to say, no, I am fully persuaded that God's way is best and I don't want this anymore in my heart and say, I refuse. That opens the door. That's humbling ourselves. I reject what I have liked, my flesh is liked. I'm going to embrace the wisdom and counsel of God. That is humility that attracts the grace of God that empowers us now to walk free from that. So we're not just talking about legalism and a bunch of do's and don'ts. No. We're talking about the empowerment of God. Right. The grace of God coming when we humble ourselves. Yeah. Yes. I just make that decision deep in my heart. I don't want this anymore. I don't want this because it hurts the heart of my Creator, and I don't want to hurt His heart anymore. That's repentance. Okay? It's an about face, a change of mind, a change of heart. And I go into that in Killing Kryptonite, how important it is. I know that people are watching right now, and they're saying that same thing. I don't want this anymore, John. I want to live the free life, the superman or superwoman life that you talked about in the beginning. Would you speak to them right now and pray for them? Yep. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every one of my brothers and sisters that's watching right now. I speak to the sin, the generational sins that have gone back to fathers and fathers and fathers of these men and women that are watching right now. I break the power of this sin off of your life. 
in the name of Jesus, I loose you. I release you. And I'm asking you now to make a decision in your heart to choose the will of God. Because this is where you will find the life that you were trying to find it in these other things. I break the deception off of your life and I release light, revelation light, flooding into your being, giving you the understanding of why it is so beneficial for you to walk with God. I break the powers of darkness now and I release you into liberty in Jesus' name, amen. Imagine a faith with no limits, a strength that overcomes every obstacle and conquers every challenge. Sound like wishful thinking? It's not. The kind of supernatural, miracle-seeing, devil-defeating life evident among the first century Christians is available to you today. But many don't experience it. And God gave John Bevere the single reason we don't. There is a spiritual kryptonite that is literally neutralizing the church, neutralizing us as individual believers. In John Bevere's powerful new book, Killing Kryptonite, he reveals the source of what destroys your strength and the secrets to totally eradicating its influence in your life. But what will this book do for you? I really believe it will open up the understanding from God's Word of how to live free and how to live a very empowered life. Go online right now to kylewinkler.org and get John Bevere's brand new book, Killing Kryptonite, Destroy What Steals Your Strength, and his anointed two-part audio series, A Window into the Rising Church. This is an exclusive package that you can't get anywhere else, and it's yours for a donation of $35. Shipping and handling is included. Could it be that we, many of us, are being neutralized by the kryptonite, so therefore we're not shining as lights? Through John's brand new book, you'll discover the source of why so many today are unable to experience the supernatural faith and strength God desires, and you'll learn how to finally break free from its bondage. I really believe this will open up avenues and doors in your life that will change you completely. In addition to helping you break free from what holds you back, I want you to break into your full potential in Christ. That's why we're including John's anointed two-part CD series, A Window into the Rising Church. In these two dynamic teachings, you'll learn the nine characteristics by which God wants to define His people, how to rediscover the power of God in the church, and how to use your God-given gifts to influence the world around you. Go online now to kylewinkler.org and get your copy of John Bevere's brand new book, Killing Kryptonite, coupled with his anointed two-part CD series, A Window into the Rising Church, for a donation of only $35. Shipping and handling is included. I opened up the Shut Up Devil app many times a few months ago when I was going through severe cancer. Kyle's ministry has spoke life into me at a time where I almost quit believing in myself. Kyle's ministry does a fantastic job encouraging you midweek. And I really started to understand that God had a plan and He had a purpose directly for me. If the devil can't keep you from being saved, which is kind of the kickstart process of looking more like Jesus, then he wants to keep you from living saved, which is the process of looking more like Jesus.